Hi everyone and welcome back to MyX Artist and Scholar Dialogue series where MyX staff and curators are speaking with different artists and scholars about their work and the impact the pandemic has had on their practice and just what they've been up to in the past year or so. My name is Lilia McEnany and I am an assistant curator at the museum and today we're going to be speaking with Jody Naranjo. Jody is a potter and sculptor from Santa Clara Pueblo. Um, her work is completely fabulous and she was MyX 2017 Native Treasures Living Treasure. Before we start chatting with Jody, um, I'd like to briefly acknowledge the place where this conversation is happening, even though we are in a virtual space and we're not at the museum today, um, in Ogopoge within the Tewa world. As a non-Native person living in so-called Santa Fe, I am a guest in the ancestral homelands of the Tewa people, and I wish to acknowledge all the Native folks, past, present, and future, who walk on these lands. So Jody, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really excited for this conversation today. Um, so to get us started, um, and for the viewers who maybe don't know you, why don't we start with a brief introduction, um, who you are, what you do, where you're from. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, it's a real honor to be with you guys and be included among the artists that you've done. That's been really, really neat to watch. So thank you. Um, my name is Jody Naranjo. I'm a potter from Santa Clara Pueblo. I've been potting for 40 plus years now. And um, I come from a long line, long line of artists, potters, sculptors, painters, um, and um, so there's like 30 or so of us in my family before me, um, goes back many generations. So I started making pottery as a child, just being alongside of everybody. And, you know, in my family, when you're a child, they give you a piece of clay and then you just sit there and make little things. I made a lot of little animals and little pots and, um, you know, stuff like that. And um, we were included in the clay gathering, the process making, on um, the firings. So pretty much you um, know how to make pottery before you even um, actually start doing it. Um, and so I think I always knew that I was going to be a potter since day one. I was in awe of the the magic of it, how you can just pull something out of the ground and and it being so spiritual and um, almost like a gift, you know, that that Mother Earth gave us. So um, being with my family and watching all the different types of potters and artists, I would just sit and watch them and um, think about you know, what I wanted to do and how I wanted to make pottery. I would sit them, sit and watch them, you know, design from one side to the other without missing a, a beat or the firing and how beautiful it was. Um, and, you know, the end, the end effect and what came out of it and seeing all the different personalities come through the clay. So, you know, needless to say, I knew what I was going to do. I, you know, there was no doubt in my mind. So, um, I sat alongside my mom and my grandma and my aunts um, at different markets at the Portal in Santa Fe and, um, you know, made little pots and would sit there and sell them and, you know, and it was fun. It was fun and I enjoyed every minute of it. So I've been doing it since. I've never had a job. Um, I raised three girls through this whole thing and um, it's been very good to me and I'm really um, happy and blessed to have had this in my life and my family. Um, so my process is very um, traditional. Um, you know, the techniques, um, the firing, the clay, it's all a traditional process. So what we do is we go out in the hills and we dig four different types of clay, um, a mica, which is like by Taos Pueblo, a brown clay from Santa Clara Pueblo, um, a, a volcanic ash out towards like Nambe Hills, and, um, and that's to make the clay hard. Um, and then also a red slip out by Cochiti Pueblo, and that's to polish this, the powdered pottery with. So, um, you know, I mix the clays, I sift them through a screen, and I um, store and age the clay. Um, I make the pots with coils. I just roll out these little snakes and put them on top of each other, and it makes the pots, um, which is the way I was taught. I've never used a will. And then after that, I sand them down with sandpaper and um, get them really smooth and even and um, get all the impurities out. And um, then I polish with the riverbed stone that is handed down from mother to daughter. Um, and that's how you get that high finish on the pots. Um, after the polishing, I will fire. I fire outside using cow manure and um, cedar wood. It's um, really hot um, and burns really fast for Gosh, about 45 minutes and that's it. That's, that's it. 
So after that, I do the designing. I design after the filing, which gets the background uh, colors to pop out. And it's kind of like a relief design. Um, my de designs are somewhere between traditional and contemporary. Um, you know, learning when you're a kid, you start copying your family members and you start using a lot of traditional um, designs. Um, and I found that I couldn't do a lot of the traditional designs well because I wasn't very good at realism. And so I kind of made my own little designs and I am um, concepts of what the traditional designs would be. And then now I'm doing all kinds of scenes, um, Pueblo scenes, city scenes, um, lots of animals, lots of um, Pueblo graphics and landscapes and all kinds of stuff. And, you know, over the last 40 years, it's kind of progressed into my kind of stylized little art form that I do. Absolutely, thank you for that. Um... I think it's so interesting that you always knew that you would be a potter. I mean, growing up in the family that you did, I guess it makes perfect, yes. sense. <laughs> it makes perfect sense. But um, I'm just wondering what that was like for you as a young person to be selling at the Portal and exhibiting at Swaya um, as a teenager. I mean, that must have been an incredible way to grow up. You know, I didn't know anything else. So um, I thought it was normal. Um, I thought everybody's mom and grandma and everybody made pottery and that's what we did. And, you know, I always enjoyed it. I enjoyed talking to people and seeing what you make out of stuff and seeing all the other artists and what they're doing. Um, so it is pretty incredible, especially with the um, people I had to um, look up to and um, learn from. I mean, they were the best and, you know, and trying to keep up with them and trying to have my own identity and that is um was um it was a little um it's a little scary but you know um you do what you do and you do what you're best at and and I just kept going because that's it was my dream and my goal to be a, a potter um now I'm doing other art forms I do glass I do um jewelry I do um bronze and sculpture I've um designed for Pendleton I've um I've made masks for the, through the pandemic um, because that was kind of a way to get my creative juices going in a way that was, you know, um, where I was able to sell something without having to go to art shows. So that was a whole new progression. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure we can talk about the pandemic and what it's done to all of us and the, um, the way we've all kind of had to learn a new way to virtually go to art markets. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and I'd love to talk about those other mediums in a little bit too, um, and especially hearing about glass and jewelry. Um, but I would like to go back a little bit and talk about um, the different types of clay that you work with. I mean, the mica, the slip, um, the volcanic ash. Mm -hmm. um, and you go out and you dig up those types of clay and then you come back and you fire them and um, do the design work afterwards. Can you just maybe talk a little bit more about that creative process for you? Um, your technique sure, is sure. What sets you apart. So I'd love to hear more about your thought process as you're doing all of those different things. With my family, you know, we've, um, we've all done a traditional Santa Clara um, type pottery. Um, some Taos, um, I have family in Taos in Pickery, so the micaceous came out of a, um, a lot of that, and that's more utilitarian um, pottery. Like my grandmother made the micaceous pottery, and we had we we ate out of it. We had bean pots and dough pots, and um, so it was used more than decorative at the time. Um, she did both. So what I do is I go to Santa Clara, um, the tribe has um, clay pits out there, and they knowing that they have you know, a quarter of all Santa Clara people are potters. So the tribe really does take care of us and, um, you know, has makes it accessible for us to go into the hills and get the clay. They um, make sure, you know, that we can drive up there and they come in and open up different veins so we can get our clay from there. Um, so that's my main clay I use. I um, get that and it's kind of like a chuckly brown color. Um, I mix it with the mica. Um, and I get that up towards the hills up by a Taos, Taos Pueblo and it's real shiny and, um, and hard. It's a, it might, it has a lot of mica in it. So I 
get that and I mix it in. Um, I use the white ash, which is a volcanic ash, which is in the hills. Like if you're driving between Santa Fe and Taos, you'll see these white little streaks in the hills. That's what I get. And, um, and I get that and I sift that and mix it in as well. So the three clays are a perfect mix. Um, I basically have piles and piles of them around my house in different buckets. And you have to get the exact um, measurements right of each one for it to work. Otherwise they're gonna break and they're gonna crack or they won't polish or they'll fall apart. So, you know, learning that um, takes a little bit of time, but you know, thank goodness I have a lot of teachers and have a lot of family members to give me advice um, and you know, that helps. Um, so basically I run everything through a screen, like an 80 mesh screen to make it very, very fine. And then I store it for about a year. Um, my grandmother always said if the, the clay needs to be very elastic and if sometimes it has a little bit of mold on the top, then you know it's ready, it's ready to form. So um, I do that um, and then I start making, I do the traditional making, I make like a little round bowl and then I start uh, making up coils and I build them kind of like a, think of an adobe house or a brick house and you just keep layer and layer and layer on top and then smooth it in and pinch it in until it, becomes the form you want. I have a lot of pots around me. Some of them are, um, you know, the raw, raw pots that aren't designed yet, and some are. Um, I do little sculptures as well, and, um, and with the clay. So I make the little figures or pots and, um, and then let them dry, sand them down. And when they're ready, I polish them. I paint the slip on there, and it's a red slip I dig by um, Coche Chi Pueblo up by Lava Hada Hill. And it's bright, bright red. It has a lot of iron in it. And that's what we used to polish. I used to use a rubber bed stone and polish and polish and polish until it becomes very shiny. Um, and that's where the shine comes in on that. So that's kind of the process of making them. Firing outdoors, um, we just get wood and cedar and put it in a little um, tin thing in the ground and pieces of metal around it and um, put uh, wood around it and burn it. And then they're fired. If you want color, you add some cow manure and it becomes darker. Great. I think um, that combination between the Taos mica and the Santa Clara brown clay is so interesting. Um, I don't think a lot of people would think that you would mix those two. Um, those two. Right? Yeah, most 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 people don't. I've, I kind of started adding in the mica because I liked a little bit of the sheen to it. And also I felt that it was in my background because my grandmother used it. So I like to keep some of those generational things going um, that have got me to where I'm at and our, where our pottery is at, at this time. So I do add in the mica because of my aunts from Taos and my, my grandmother. Yeah. Um, and I like that the effect it gets. Absolutely. And then also adding in the red slip all the way down south at Cochiti too. It just, you have a huge um, range of materials that you're working with. It must have taken a lifetime to get to know all of those different things so well. It has. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it sure has. It's taken me yeah. a, long, a long time to figure out colors, firing, um, how, hot, how hot you want your wood, wood to burn, how, the, how much um, cow manure you want. I've, um, I have experimented with different kinds of manure <laughs> too, um, sheep and horse. And um, so, you know, we learn different um, ways of experimenting. Also, you know, we're real limited to the amount of colors that we have um, because everything is dug out of the ground. So trying to find new colors, new colors of slip, um, the levels of firing make different colors. Um, and you know, you want to, you want to get, a, a, as much of a variety as you can through that. Absolutely. Um, and so moving towards post, um, firing, can you talk a little bit about the work that you do in your designs and the relief, um, work that you do? Well, what I do is I just kind of look at the pot, like it's a, see like this pot here, that's a plain pot after the firing. So what I'll do is um, look at it and let it sit for a while. It's kind of like a, a blank canvas. And I think, well, what would look nice on that? What does the shape represent? What is 
what colors um, would, you know, what everything works on there. And then I, it, when it comes to me, then I just start, I get my exacto knife, never draw anything out. Um, I don't want to leave any pencil marks or, and I'm not good at drawing anyway. So um, I just start carving. I just start carving. And generally I'll think like, say if that was going to be a horse piece, I would start in the middle and just put horses like an outline and then probably carve around them with the knife to get the um, inside of the pot, which is still light colored to pop through. And it's kind of, then it's like a relief. So the horse would be there and then everything else around it would be white. I like to do this really light etching, which um, is it, real good for designing and for patterns and geometrics and for um, lots of just different um, geometric designs. And so I like to add that in and I use the exacto knife just in that whole process. Um, occasionally I'll add in some paints, um, whether it be traditional paints or sometimes acrylic paints, just depending on um, the piece and what I want it to be. Um, you know, of course we don't use acrylics traditionally, but sometimes they're really fun to add in. And, um, and I think at this time in traditional Pueblo pottery, um, it is um, accepted if you use it and you are also very, uh, of, you know, let people know that that is acrylic paint. Mm -hmm. um, so I do about half and half with the traditional paints and then sometimes the acrylic paints. Um, but I always do make sure that, it, you know, it is known what kind of paints I'm using. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it must allow for a whole, kind of a whole new world to uh, be using acrylic paint and just a whole new range of um, colors. Yeah, you get color, <laughs> you get color. <laughs> you get bright colors and metallics and, you know, colors that you wouldn't get through our traditional paints. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fun, it was fun once I started doing that, maybe about 10, 15 years ago, I thought, I'm going to go for it. So I started doing it here and there and people liked it. Some people did it. I got both, both sides. So I still do both, um, you know, and it's just kind of what I'm feeling at the time. If I feel that uh, what I feel like making, you know, I do have to entertain myself as well, doing this all day. So I want to make sure that I'm progressing, that I'm experimenting, that I'm um, trying new things, that um, I, I'm doing something different. Otherwise, I would just get extremely bored or restless if I was just doing the same thing over and over. So I have to keep um, myself engaged in it as well. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Um, so thank you for sharing all of that. Um, I would like to kind of go back to something that you said a little bit earlier about the other mediums that you're working in lately, um, glass, jewelry, bronze, sculpture. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that side of your work too? Because I think a lot of times people only know you as a potter. Yes, um, I have been a potter for 40 years. So um, I never thought I'd be anything else. You know, I never thought I'd be anything else. And what I was doing um, with, I had, little girls always, always sitting next to me. Not anymore, they're grown up, they're adults. But I always had these little girls sitting there with next to me and I would make these little um, figures just to occupy them. And I make like a sea pot and coils and little balls and kind of like Mr. Potato Head. And I would just put them together and I say, here, you finish this. And, um, I, you know, I'd make them animals and I say, here's your dog or here's me and you, or here's, you know, this goat or this sheep or this horse, whatever. And the kids would sit there and laugh and get into it and finish them up. So I had all these little figures around the house um, and um, people would come by to buy pottery. This was 20 plus years ago. And they would um, say, wow, these are cool. What are, you know, what is it? And I would say, well, I make these for my kids or just for fun. And so people started to um, order those or buy them or ask me to make certain little animals or people. So um, what I was doing at the time is I was making little animals and I'll show you one right here. So I would make these little little animals and it would have like a little round seed pot in the middle. And then these are just coils and then ears and a tail. And I used an earring for his little collar. And, um, but you know, I made these also on a large scale. So I had them all around the house and I would tell the kids, this is your dog and his name, I would always name them and you know, like here. So the kids would wander around the house with them and wrap them in blankets and uh, they'd always be breaking them. I'd have to glue them back together and repaint them. And they, they would disappear off my shelves because the kids would hide them because they wanted to play with them. And um, one time I was at a show and there was one, my, one of my little girls really wanted and she stood in front of it and she told people, don't buy that one because oh. I, my mom said, if it doesn't sell that I get to keep it. 
<laughs> and I was like, go away. <laughs> You're ruining my sale. <laughs> so I finally just pulled it off the thing. I said, here, just take this and go somewhere else. <laughs> Let me do my thing here. We need, you know. <laughs> So that's where these little animals came in and um, people would come by and pick them, you know, pick, pick them out and the kids would cry because they would get attached to them. But, you know, that's been, that was how the little animals and the sculpture progressed in, in my, um, in my, um, my art career. But then um, Blue Rain, uh, the owner from Blue Rain came along one day and said, how about we bronze these? And I said, hey, that's a great idea because I'm really tired of um, fixing them. <laughs> People take them home and then they're calling me, they're breakable and kids are very attached to them. So, or uh, attracted to them, I should say. And they grab them and break them and people were shipping back little animals to me and I was fixing them constantly. And it's harder to fix them than it is to make them. So, you know, that got exhausting. So I kind of stopped making them and taking them at that point. So uh, Leroy from Blue Rain said, let's, let's bronze these. And I was like, wow, great idea. So I would make one or two and then at a time, and then we would turn them into bronze and additions of 25. Um, and the patinas that we could use were color in itself. We could use any color, turquoise, gold, and I, black or white, you know, I could paint them in a patina. So that was pretty neat. Um, so I started doing that and um, that's been a fun, uh, fun, pro fun process for me. Um, a whole new, a whole new um, collection, a whole new type of people who like those. Um, and then the museum started getting them. Uh, I have a life-size deer that's at the Smithsonian in, in, um, in DC and the director loved that big deer. His name was Oscar. He was a big deer and um, he loved him so much. So he sits by the entrance and he greets people when they come to the Smithsonian. So I thought that was nice that not just my pottery, but my, my sculptures are now there. So that was pretty neat. Um, I've also worked with jewelry. I don't do the work. I did take jewelry classes back at IAIA, you know, in the eighties, but um, I just design. I design for a company called American West and we do all kinds of uh, my designs. Um, I draw them out and do the designing, but I don't do the work. Um, and that's a, a lot of fun to make it wearable art, um, you know, using silver and um, different stones and seeing my little girls and my, my little animals in different um, jewelry pieces, which I really love. Um, I've designed for Pendleton um, with different of my designs and um, I made masks during the pandemic because that was something everybody wanted and it seemed like a lot of artists were doing it and it was fun and got to do that. And, um, you know, so lots of masks um, helped get me through the, the pandemic because we didn't have any art shows for a whole year. Um, what else have I done? Glass, I just did a big glass show um, at Blu-ray Gallery and I did a collaboration with um, Preston Singletary. It was our third collaboration and Basically, um, I would go out to Seattle and we would, I would draw out these um, pottery shapes, which look just like my pottery shapes, and we would put them in um, glass form, two different colors of glass. And um, then I would design them just like my pottery. I'd etch off the surface and I used like kind of like a, a, a film, a, a, like a thick tape. And I would etch, take that off with my X-Acto knife and then the sandblaster would come in and sandblast those areas like a relief, kind of like I do on my pottery so that you could um, see the designs. And that's been really fun and really exciting because, you know, I've never had light or um, the, those certain colors being, being able to work with um, and they've just really beautiful. So that's been fun to work with. And, um, and it's nice I got to work with Preston because he's, pretty good and you know and a great teacher and it's been a lot of fun to work in that medium as well yeah I saw that show at Blue Rain and was just completely blown away um I wanted to ask you about the process for that too um and so it's interesting that it was the sandblaster who came in and kind of yes to life because I was so I was just staring at these items trying to figure out how you guys did this <laughs> so. yeah it, it's hard to carve glass with an exacto knife Yes. So um, what I and we, the layers in the glass are two. There's a, like a clear layer of color, and then there's like a dark, like a non-see-through um, color that we do on the outside of the um, of the glass. So you know we pick these two different colors, and I'm trying to go as much. 
I can in, in traditional colors. I want them to look like pottery, um, but in glass form. So, you know, picking out the colors, you, you have color, excuse me, but you don't have the, um, they're see-through and you're getting to see the light and you can see the design from the inside out, which is really neat for me. Um, you know, and then I bring them all back with, well, ship them all back because they're big, they're big pieces. I ship them all back and I sit here for months on end just carving these glass pieces and I'm kind of, I'm carving away the, the relief form. So I, I'm getting what is sandblasted will be see-through and what is not um, sandblasted will, um, so it's kind of like my pottery. It's hard to explain, but it's just like my pottery. And then I go back, I send them back to Preston and he sandblasts them out. Um, and then we get this and the end result, like Christmas morning when you open up the, you know, everything and you're like, wow, look at this, look at this, look at this, look. But you don't get to see the end result until after the process is done. So we were really happy with the um, outcome of all three shows. I think this last one um, was more pottery oriented, um, shapes, colors, designs. Um, so I think I'm, I'm starting to come out um, and be a little more brave because um, it's intimidating to work with somebody as good as Preston. You don't wanna, you know, you're just listening to what to do and how to do it. And this time I think I got a little bit more brave and said, okay, you know, I like, I see this and I see that and I like this and I like that. And, you know, he's so um, easy and he lets you do that. He lets you let your, 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 um, your, idea of what it should be come through he doesn't tell you no he just says yes do what you think Jody no yes so that's pretty nice to work with somebody like that yeah he sounds like a wonderful collaborator and the way that you said sure yes yeah in pottery and glass form that's kind of exactly how I saw it I could definitely see you in um the pieces there um, thank you also the way they did them was incredible from below it was just it's a great show um so yeah. Um, I'd love to talk to you about your masks too. Um, you mentioned that you started making those during the pandemic. How has that been going? Well, with the pandemic, it was pretty shocking. Um, you know, we I, we were at the herd show, and you know, um, the the coronavirus was starting to come out and people so all of us were like well where's everybody at <laughs> you know and and I think that's when we all started to realize okay and our art forms are um, person to person you know you need to see them talk to the artists be able to um, you know be there in person to see these this art art form um, and hear from the artists about what it means and how you made it and all that so that's when I think it hit a lot of us that this it was going to be different. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the museums and um, they started doing virtual shows, which is nice because it, you can still talk to people and see people and um, market your artwork um, because, you know, this is the way that we make a living. Um, so, you know, it was a real change. Um, I think artists are used to being alone at home. Um, are used to not being out in, in the world, except for when we um, go out to art markets. So, you know, um, I think that was easier being at home working, but trying to figure out how to sell them or how to uh, market them was a whole new venture for all of us. And, and people were also, you know, the economy was bad and it was a hard time for um, everybody. So, it, um, it was just a harder time. So I think a lot of us sat around like, okay, what are we gonna do? Um, you know, a lot of us made masks and I made masks and, you know, did my designs on them and, and uh, people loved them. And I have a large collection of other artists of their masks. And that was fun. That was fun because you're getting to say, oh, and I'm wearing so-and-so's mask or look at this mask or did you get so-and-so's mask? You know, and it was fun. Um, so that was fun. It was a fun thing and it helped us all to, um, you know, get through some of the months that we were pretty much at home without a, a job. <laughs> you know, um, I was working at home and making pottery and making my other things and not having to run around and be at um, all of these events and be at all of the art shows and markets really gave me time to sit and reflect on um, and what I want to do. And I think it gave me a little bit more time to concentrate on some of the projects 
or ideas I've had that I didn't have time for before. Um, so that was nice. Um, you know, good things and bad things came out of it. And those are one of the things that I, I think were good without realizing it at the time. It really gave me um, some more time to work on projects that I didn't think I was going to be able to do or eventually would get to, but didn't. And I enjoyed that. Um, also, I became a new grandmother. So that was kind of good timing too, because it gave me time to stay at home with my grandson and play and, um, you know, just spend that quality time that I would have probably not had um, such, such um, an open time for, you know, my kids were working and I was um, able to take care of him. And I appreciate that. I really do appreciate that. And still have him two, three days a week. He'll be here tomorrow. And and we play and he's a year and a half and a little boy, which I never had. So I really enjoyed that. Um, so, you know, the pandemic was an interesting thing. We're starting to get back out there. Um, I had my glass show and got to talk to people and see people I hadn't seen in a while. And thank goodness, um, you know, we're at a point where we're all getting vaccinated and people were um, able to come and see the pieces and Boy, and I didn't realize how much I missed them. <laughs> I missed everybody um, and missed talking to people. And um, so hopefully, you know, some of the art shows will be coming back soon. Um, I'm working on pottery, so I'll be ready. Yes. Well, first of all, congratulations um, on the birth <laughs> of your grandson. That must be so lovely. Um, and yeah, I mean, I remember the herd being kind of the last normal thing that I did too. And then I remember that Sunday that we got back is kind of when everybody started freaking out. <laughs> yes, it was the time. It was yeah. that week. We were like, yeah. oh boy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because I think for a lot of artists, at least in my experience, I mean, my mom is an artist and I think she's handling the pandemic better than anyone else I know because she's used to just kind of being with her work but on the other side of it I mean there are these relationships that you have that kind of make the whole process feel a lot more communal um so I think it will be really interesting to see um what everybody comes out with and how everybody has been spending their time um over the past year I think we're going to maybe have the best herd and sly ever um to kind of I agree, I agree. there's been really interesting yeah. things that are coming out you know I've seen some of what my art my friends and you know my artist friends have been working on and it's pretty incredible to see what people are doing at home this whole time mm -hmm. um art is a very solitude um job <laughs> you know we don't we don't we don't have a lot of interruption with other people and we get on our own heads a lot and stay stay in and work so um you know that part we were used to um but we had each other in a way um, of like well, what are you working on or what are you working on and Thank goodness for face, face, um, Facebook or um, Zoom or you know just any type of interaction we could have with each other, um, and knowing that we weren't alone in this, um, that we were all going through it at the same time, um, was helpful. Um, and I'm really interested to see what all these massive sculptures and giant pieces of jewelry that are going to come out of this because people have really um, had the time to do projects that kind of were on the side burner or that they had thought someday I'll do. Um, so I'm excited to see all of that come out as well. I think it's gonna be big. It's gonna be huge, yeah. So, I mean, on that note, um, this is a big question, but where do you see the world of native art moving as we're kind of coming, maybe coming out of the pandemic? Um, what do you kind of envision the future looking like? Well, I don't think we'll change all that much. Um, you know, I think we'll be more grateful and we'll be um, very excited and happy that we can go back to art shows. You know, they're hard and they're a lot of work, but it made us, I, uh, I, I sure will appreciate being able to take, you know, make, go out and talk to people and, you know, um, be in a show with, with people um, and show them what I'm working on and seeing the other artists. And I think that that is gonna be something that we'll all really appreciate. Um, you know, in, in, I don't think that things will change a whole lot as far as the work because we all do a traditional craft. I think maybe we'll um, be doing bigger and better and getting in our own heads of what, how far we can push it but um, it is a traditional art form. So 
um, I think that if anything, we'll just have a lot more appreciation for it. And, um, and not just the artists, but I think people in general, collectors and museums, um, you know, we've all had a, a rough year. Um, and I think that it, it will just be a really grateful to all of us to get back to our, our lives. And, you know, I think that's what it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm that, I think that's a great place to end it unless there's anything else that you'd like to talk about um, before we sign off. I think we got it. I think that was good. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, yeah. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. This is nice. It's been a very nice um, talk. <laughs> and I appreciate being included in all of this. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Jody, And thank you, everybody, for watching.